Miscellaneous Verses or Reflections on the State of My Mind During My First Convictions of the Necessity of Believing the Truth and Experiencing the Inestimable Benefits of Christianity. Well may I say my life has been one scene of sorrow and of pain, from early days I griefs have known, and as I grew my griefs have grown. Dangers were always in my path, and fear of wrath, and sometimes death, while pale dejection in me reigned I often wept, by grief constrained. When taken from my native land, by an unjust and cruel band, how did uncommon dread prevail? My sighs no more I could conceal. To ease my mind I often strove, and tried my trouble to remove, I sung, and uttered sighs between, essayed to stifle guilt with sin. But oh! Not all that I could do would stop the current of my woe, conviction still my vileness showed, how great my guilt, how lost from God. Prevented, that I could not die, nor might to one kind refuge fly, an orphan state I had to mourn, forsook by all, and left forlorn. Those who beheld my downcast mien could not guess at my woes unseen, they by appearance could not know the troubles that I waded through. Lust, anger, blasphemy, and pride, with legions of such ills beside, troubled my thoughts, while doubts and fears clouded and darkened most my years. Sighs now no more would be confined, they breathed the trouble of my mind, I wished for death, but checked the word, and often prayed unto the Lord. Unhappy, more than some on earth, I thought the place that gave me birth, strange thoughts oppressed, while I replied why not in Ethiopia died? And why thus spared, nigh to hell? God only knew, I could not tell. A tottering fence, a bowing wall thought myself fair since the fall. Oft times I mused, nigh despair, while birds melodious filled the air, thrice happy songsters, ever free, how blessed were they compared to me. Thus all things added to my pain, while grief compelled me to complain, when sable clouds began to rise my mind grew darker than the skies. The English nation called to leave, how did my breast with sorrows heave? I longed for rest, cried help me, Lord. Some mitigation, Lord, afford. Yet on, dejected, still I went, heart throbbing woes within were pent, nor land, nor sea could comfort give, nothing my anxious mind relieve. Weary with travail, yet unknown to all but God and self alone, numerous months for peace I strove, and numerous foes I had to prove. Inert to dangers, griefs, and woes, trained up midst perils, deaths, and foes, I said must it thus ever be? No quiet is permitted me. Hard hap, and more than heavy lot. I prayed to God forget me not, what thou ordainst twilling I'll bear, but oh! deliver from despair. Strivings and wrestlings seemed in vain, nothing I did could ease my pain, then gave I up my works and will, confessed and own my doom was hell. Like some poor prisoner at the bar, conscious of guilt, of sin and fear, arraigned, and self-condemned, I stood, lost in the world, and in my blood. Yet here, midst blackest clouds confined, a beam from Christ, the day star, shinned, surely, thought I, if Jesus please, he can at once sign my release. I, ignorant of his righteousness, set up my labours in its place, forgot for why his blood was shed, and prayed and fasted in its stead. He did for sinners, I am one. Might not his blood for me atone? Though I am nothing else but sin yet surely he can make me clean. Thus light came in, and I beloved, myself forgot, and help received. My Saviour then I know I found, for, eased from guilt, no more I groaned. Oh, happy hour, in which I ceased to mourn, for then I found a rest. My soul and Christ were now as one, thy light, O Jesus, in me shone. Blessed be thy name for now I know I and my works can nothing do, the Lord alone can ransom man, for this the spotless lamb was slain.
when sacrifices, works, and prayer profit vain, and ineffectual were, lo, then I come. The Saviour cried, and, bleeding, bowed his head and did. He did for all who ever saw no help in them, nor by the law, I this have seen, and gladly own salvation is by Christ alone. Chapter 11 The author embarks on board a ship bound for Cadiz, is near being shipwrecked, goes to Malaga, remarkable fine cathedral there, the author disputes with a popish priest, picking up eleven miserable men at sea and returning to England, engages again with Dr. Irving to accompany him to Jamaica and the Mosquito Shore, meets with an Indian prince on board, the author attempts to instruct him in the truths of the gospel. Frustrated by the bad example of some in the ship, they arrive on the Mosquito Shore with some slaves they purchased at Jamaica, and begin to cultivate a plantation, some account of the manners and customs of the Mosquito Indians, successful device of the authors to quell a riot among them, curious entertainment given by them to Dr. Irving and the author, who leaves the shore and goes for Jamaica, is barbarously treated by a man with whom he engaged for his passage, escapes and goes to the Mosquito Admiral, who treats him kindly. He gets another vessel and goes on board. Instances of bad treatment, meets Dr. Irving, gets to Jamaica, is cheated by his captain, leaves the doctor and goes for England. When our ship was got ready for sea again, I was entreated by the captain to go in her once more. But, as I felt myself now as happy as I could wish to be in this life, I for some time refused. However, the advice of my friends at last prevailed, and, in full resignation to the will of God, I again embarked for Cadiz in March 1775. We had a very good passage, without any material accident, until we arrived off the Bay of Cadiz, when one Sunday, just as we were going into the harbour, the ship struck against a rock and knocked off a garboard plank, which is the next to the keel. In an instant all hands were in the greatest confusion, and began with loud cries to call on God to have mercy on them. Although I could not swim, and saw no way of escaping death, I felt no dread in my then situation, having no desire to live. I even rejoiced in spirit, thinking this death would be sudden glory. But the fullness of time was not yet come. The people near to me were much astonished in seeing me thus calm and resigned but I told them of the peace of God, which through sovereign grace I enjoyed, and these words were that instant in my mind. Christ is my pilot wise, my compass is his word, my soul each storm defies, while I have such a Lord. I trust his faithfulness and power, to save me in the trying hour. Though rocks and quicksands deep through all my passage lie, yet Christ shall safely keep and guide me with his eye. How can I sink with such a prop, that bears the world and all things up? At this time there were many large Spanish flukers or passage vessels full of people crossing the channel, who seeing our condition, a number of them came alongside of us. As many hands as could be employed began to work, some at our three pumps, and the rest unloading the ship as fast as possible. The being only a single rock called the porpoise on which we struck, we soon got off it, and providentially it was then high water, we therefore run the ship ashore at the nearest place to keep her from sinking. After many tides, with a great deal of care and industry, we got her repaired again. When we had dispatched our business at Cadiz, we went to Gibraltar, and from thence to Malaga, a very pleasant and rich city, where there is one of the finest cathedrals I had ever seen. It had been above fifty years in building, as I heard, though it was not then quite finished, great part of the inside, however, was completed and highly decorated with the richest marble columns and many superb paintings, it was lighted occasionally by an amazing number of wax tapers of different sizes, some of which were as thick as a man's thigh, these, however, were only used on some of their grand festivals. I was very much shocked at the custom of bull baiting, and other diversions which prevailed here on Sunday evenings, to the great scandal of Christianity and morals. I used to express my abhorrence of it to a priest whom I met with. I had frequent contests about religion with the Reverend Father, 
in which he took great pains to make a proselyte of me to his church, and I no less to convert him to mine. On these occasions I used to produce my Bible, and show him in what points his church erred. He then said he had been in England, and that every person there read the Bible, which was very wrong, but I answered him that Christ desired us to search the scriptures. In his zeal for my conversion, he solicited me to go to one of the universities in Spain, and declared that I should have my education free, and told me, if I got myself made a priest, I might in time become even Pope, and that Pope Benedict was a black man. As I was ever desirous of learning, I paused for some time upon this temptation, and thought by being crafty I might catch some with guile, but I began to think that it would be only hypocrisy in me to embrace his offer, as I could not in conscience conform to the opinions of his church. I was therefore enabled to regard the word of God, which says, Come out from amongst them, and refused Father Vincent's offer. So we parted without conviction on either side. Having taken at this place some fine wines, fruits, and money, we proceeded to Cadiz, where we took about two tons more of money, and sea. And then sailed for England in the month of June. When we were about the north latitude 42, we had contrary wind for several days, and the ship did not make in that time above six or seven miles straight course. This made the captain exceeding fretful and peevish and I was very sorry to hear God's most holy name often blasphemed by him. One day, as he was in that impious mood, a young gentleman on board, who was a passenger, reproached him, and said he acted wrong, for we ought to be thankful to God for all things, as we were not in want of anything on board, and though the wind was contrary for us, yet it was fair for some others, who, perhaps, stood in more need of it than we. I immediately seconded this young gentleman with some boldness, and said we had not the least cause to murmur, for that the Lord was better to us than we deserved, and that he had done all things well. I expected that the captain would be very angry with me for speaking, but he replied not a word. However, before that time on the following day, being the 21st of June, much to our great joy and astonishment, we saw the providential hand of our benign Creator, whose ways with his blind creatures are past finding out. The preceding night I dreamed that I saw a boat immediately off the starboard main shrouds, and exactly at half past one o'clock, the following day at noon, while I was below, just as we had dined in the cabin, the man at the helm cried out, a boat, which brought my dream that instant into my mind. I was the first man that jumped on the deck, and, looking from the shrouds onward, according to my dream, I descried a little boat at some distance, but, as the waves were high, it was as much as we could do sometimes to discern her, we however stopped the ship's way, and the boat, which was extremely small, came alongside with eleven miserable men, whom we took on board immediately. To all human appearance. These people must have perished in the course of one hour or less, the boat being small, it barely contained them. When we took them up they were half drowned, and had no victuals, compass, water, or any other necessary whatsoever, and had only one bit of an auto steer with, and that right before the wind, so that they were obliged to trust entirely to the mercy of the waves. As soon as we got them all on board, they bowed themselves on their knees, and, with hands and voices lifted up to heaven, thanked God for their deliverance, and I trust that my prayers were not wanting amongst them at the same time. This mercy of the Lord quite melted me, and I recollected his words, which I saw thus verified in the 107th Psalm O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted in them. They cried unto Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul, and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. 
they that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord, and his wonders in the deep. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. The poor distressed captain said, That the Lord is good, for, seeing that I am not fit to die, he therefore gave me a space of time to repent. I was very glad to hear this expression, and took an opportunity when convenient of talking to him on the providence of God. They told us they were Portuguese, and were in a brig loaded with corn, which shifted that morning at five o'clock, owing to which the vessel sunk that instant with two of the crew, and how these eleven got into the boat, which was lashed to the deck, not one of them could tell. We provided them with every necessary, and brought them all safe to London, and I hope the Lord gave them repentance unto life eternal. I was happy once more amongst my friends and brethren, till November, when my old friend, the celebrated Dr. Irving, bought a remarkable fine sloop, about 150 tons. He had a mind for a new adventure in cultivating a plantation at Jamaica and the Mosquito Shore, asked me to go with him, and said that he would trust me with his estate in preference to any one. By the advice, therefore, of my friends, I accepted of the offer, knowing that the harvest was fully ripe in those parts, and hoped to be the instrument, under God, of bringing some poor sinner to my well beloved Master, Jesus Christ. Before I embarked, I found with the doctor four Mosquito Indians, who were chiefs in their own country, and were brought here by some English traders for some selfish ends. One of them was the Mosquito King's son, a youth of about eighteen years of age, and whilst he was here he was baptized by the name of George. They were going back at the government's expense, after having been in England about twelve months, during which they learned to speak pretty good English. When I came to talk to them about eight days before we sailed, I was very much mortified in finding that they had not frequented any churches since they were here, to be baptized nor was any attention paid to their morals. I was very sorry for this mock Christianity, and had just an opportunity to take some of them once to church before we sailed. We embarked in the month of November 1775, on board of the sloop Morning Star, Captain David Miller, and sailed for Jamaica. In our passage, I took all the pains that I could to instruct the Indian prince in the doctrines of Christianity of which he was entirely ignorant, and, to my great joy, he was quite attentive, and received with gladness the truths that the Lord enabled me to set forth to him. I taught him in the compass of eleven days all the letters, and he could put even two or three of them together and spell them. I had Fox's martyrology with cuts, and he used to be very fond of looking into it, and would ask many questions about the papal cruelties he saw depicted there which I explained to him. I made such progress with this youth, especially in religion, that when I used to go to bed at different hours of the night, if he was in his bed, he would get up on purpose to go to prayer with me, without any other clothes than his shirt, and before he would eat any of his meals amongst the gentlemen in the cabin, he would first come to me to pray, as he called it. I was well pleased at this, and took great delight in him and used much supplication to God for his conversion. I was in full hope of seeing daily every appearance of that change which I could wish, not knowing the devices of Satan, who had many of his emissaries to sow his tares as fast as I sowed the good seed, and pulled down as fast as I built up. Thus we went on nearly four-fifths of our passage, when Satan at last got the upper hand. Some of his messengers, seeing this poor heathen much advanced in piety, began to ask him whether I had converted him to Christianity, laughed, and made their jest at him, for which I rebuked them as much as I could, but this treatment caused the prince to halt between two opinions. Some of the true sons of Belial, who did not believe that there was any hereafter, told him never to fear the devil, for there was none existing, and if ever he came to the prince, they desired he might be sent to them. Thus they teased the poor innocent youth, so that he would not learn his book any more. He would not drink nor carouse with these ungodly actors, nor would he be with me, even at prayers. This grieved me very much. 
I endeavored to persuade him as well as I could, but he would not come, and entreated him very much to tell me his reasons for acting thus. At last he asked me, How comes it that all the white men on board who can read and write, and observe the sun, and know all things, yet swear, lie, and get drunk, only excepting yourself? I answered him, The reason was, that they did not fear God, and that if any one of them died so they could not go to, or be happy with God. He replied, That if these persons went to hell, he would go to hell too. I was sorry to hear this, and, as he sometimes hid the two thatch, and also some other persons in the ship at the same time, I asked him if their two thatch made his easy, he said, No. Then I told him if he and these people went to hell together, their pains would not make his any lighter. This answer had great weight with him. It depressed his spirits much, and he became ever after, during the passage, fond of being alone. When we were in the latitude of Martinico, and near making the land, one morning we had a brisk gale of wind, and, carrying too much sail, the mainmast went over the side. Many people were then all about the deck, and the yards, masts, and rigging, came tumbling all about us, yet there was not one of us in the least hurt, although some were within a hair's breadth of being killed, and, particularly, I saw two men then, by the providential hand of God, most miraculously preserved from being smashed to pieces. On the 5th of January we made Antigua and Montserrat, and ran along the rest of the islands, and on the 14th we arrived at Jamaica. One Sunday while we were there I took the Mosquito Prince George to church, where he saw the sacrament administered. When we came out we saw all kinds of people, almost from the church door for the space of half a mile down to the water side, buying and selling all kinds of commodities, and these acts afforded me great matter of exhortation to this youth, who was much astonished. Our vessel being ready to sail for the Mosquito Shore, I went with the doctor on board a guinea man, to purchase some slaves to carry with us, and cultivate a plantation, and I chose them all my own countrymen. On the 12th of February we sailed from Jamaica, and on the 18th arrived at the Mosquito Shore, at a place called Dupipi. All our Indian guests now, after I had admonished them and a few cases of liquor given them by the doctor, took an affectionate leave of us, and went ashore, where they were met by the Mosquito King, and we never saw one of them afterwards. We then sailed to the southward of the shore, to a place called Cape Gracias Adios, where there was a large lagoon or lake, which received the emptying of two or three very fine large rivers, and abounded much in fish and land tortoise. Some of the native Indians came on board of us here, and we used them well, and told them we were come to dwell amongst them, which they seemed pleased at. So the doctor and I, with some others, went with them ashore, and they took us to different places to view the land, in order to choose a place to make a plantation of. We fixed on a spot near a river's bank, in a rich soil, and, having got our necessaries out of the sloop, we began to clear away the woods, and plant different kinds of vegetables, which had a quick growth. While we were employed in this manner, our vessel went northward to Black River to trade. While she was there, a Spanish guard Acosta met with and took her. This proved very hurtful, and a great embarrassment to us. However, we went on with the culture of the land. We used to make fires every night all around us, to keep off wild beasts, which, as soon as it was dark, set up a most hideous roaring. Our habitation being far up in the woods, we frequently saw different kinds of animals, but none of them ever hurt us, except poisonous snakes, the bite of which the doctor used to cure by giving to the patient, as soon as possible, about half a tumbler of strong rum, with a good deal of cayenne pepper in it. In this manner he cured two natives and one of his own slaves. The Indians were exceedingly fond of the doctor, and they had good reason for it for I believe they never had such an useful man amongst them. They came from all quarters to our dwelling, and some wool wow, or flat-headed Indians, who lived fifty or sixty miles above our river, and this side of the South Sea, brought us a good deal of silver in exchange for our goods. 
the principal articles we could get from our neighboring Indians, were turtle oil, and shells, little silk grass, and some provisions, but they would not work at anything for us, except fishing, and a few times they assisted to cut some trees down, in order to build us houses, which they did exactly like the Africans, by the joint labor of men, women, and children. I do not recollect any of them to have had more than two wives. These always accompanied their husbands when they came to our dwelling, and then they generally carried whatever they brought to us, and always squatted down behind their husbands. Whenever we gave them anything to eat, the men and their wives ate it separate. I never saw the least sign of incontinence amongst them. The women are ornamented with beads, and fond of painting themselves, the men also paint, even to excess, both their faces and shirts. Their favorite color is red. The women generally cultivate the ground, and the men are all fishermen and canoe makers. Upon the whole, I never met any nation that was so simple in their manners as these people, or had so little ornament in their houses. Neither had they, as I ever could learn, one word expressive of an oath. The worst word I ever heard amongst them when they were quarreling, was one that they had got from the English, which was, you rascal. I never saw any mode of worship among them, but in this they were not worse than their European brethren or neighbors, for I am sorry to say that there was not one white person in our dwelling, nor anywhere else that I saw in different places I was at on the shore, that was better or more pious than those unenlightened Indians, but they either worked or slept on Sundays, and, to my sorrow, working was too much Sunday's employment with ourselves, so much so that in some length of time we really did not know one day from another. This mode of living laid the foundation of my decamping at last. The natives are well made and warlike, and they particularly boast of having never been conquered by the Spaniards. They are great drinkers of strong liquors when they can get them. We used to distill rum from pine apples, which were very plentiful here, and then we could not get them away from our place. Yet they seemed to be singular, in point of honesty, above any other nation I was ever amongst. The country being hot, we lived under an open shed, where we had all kinds of goods, without a door or a lock to any one article, yet we slept in safety, and never lost anything, or were disturbed. This surprised us a good deal, and the doctor, myself, and others, used to say, if we were to lie in that manner in Europe we should have our throats cut the first night. The Indian governor goes once in a certain time all about the province or district, and has a number of men with him as attendants and assistants. He settles all the differences among the people, like the judge here, and is treated with very great respect. He took care to give us timely notice before he came to our habitation, by sending his stick as a token, for rum, sugar, and gunpowder, which we did not refuse sending and at the same time we made the utmost preparation to receive his honor and his train. When he came with his tribe, and all our neighboring chieftains, we expected to find him a grave reverend judge, solid and sagacious, but instead of that, before he and his gang came in sight, we heard them very clamorous, and they even had plundered some of our good neighboring Indians, having intoxicated themselves with our liquor. When they arrived we did not know what to make of our new guests, and would gladly have dispensed with the honor of their company. However, having no alternative, we feasted them plentifully all the day till the evening, when the governor, getting quite drunk, grew very unruly, and struck one of our most friendly chiefs, who was our nearest neighbor, and also took his gold-laced hat from him. At this a great commotion taken place, and the doctor interfered to make peace, as we could all understand one another, but to no purpose, and at last they became so outrageous that the doctor, fearing he might get into trouble, left the house, and made the best of his way to the nearest wood, leaving me to do as well as I could among them. I was so enraged with the governor, that I could have wished to have seen him tied fast to a tree and flogged for his behavior but I had not people enough to cope with his party. I therefore thought of a stratagem to appease the riot. Recollecting a passage I had read in the life of Columbus, when he was amongst the Indians in Mexico or Peru, where, 
On some occasion, he frightened them, by telling them of certain events in the heavens. I had recourse to the same expedient, and it succeeded beyond my most sanguine expectations. When I had formed my determination, I went in the midst of them, and, taking hold of the governor, I pointed up to the heavens. I menaced him and the rest, I told them God lived there, and that he was angry with them, and they must not quarrel so, that they were all brothers, and if they did not leave off, and go away quietly, I would take the book, pointing to the Bible, read, and tell God to make them dead. This was something like magic. The clamor immediately ceased, and I gave them some rum and a few other things, after which they went away peaceably, and the governor afterwards gave our neighbor, who was called Captain Plasmia, his hat again. When the doctor returned, he was exceedingly glad at my success in thus getting rid of our troublesome guests. The mosquito people within our vicinity, out of respect to the doctor, myself and his people, made entertainments of the grand kind, called in their tongue Turi or Drake Bot. The English of this expression is, a feast of drinking about, of which it seems a corruption of language. The drink consisted of pine apples roasted, and cassades chewed or beaten in mortars, which, after lying some time, ferments, and becomes so strong as to intoxicate, when drank in any quantity. We had timely notice given to us of the entertainment. A white family, within five miles of us, told us how the drink was made, and I and two others went before the time to the village, where the mirth was appointed to be held and there we saw the whole art of making the drink, and also the kind of animals that were to be eaten there. I cannot say the sight of either the drink or the meat were enticing to me. They had some thousands of pine apples roasting, which they squeezed, dirt and all, into a canoe they had there for the purpose. The cassar drink was in beef barrels and other vessels, and looked exactly like hog Washington men, women, and children, were thus employed in roasting the pine apples, and squeezing them with their hands. For food they had many land torpins or tortoises, some dried turtle, and three large alligators alive, and tied fast to the trees. I asked the people what they were going to do with these alligators, and I was told they were to be eaten. I was much surprised at this, and went home, not a little disgusted at the preparations. When the day of the feast was come, we took some rum with us, and went to the appointed place, where we found a great assemblage of these people, who received us very kindly. The mirth had begun before we came, and they were dancing with music, and the musical instruments were nearly the same as those of any other sable people, but, as I thought, much less melodious than any other nation I ever knew. They had many curious gestures in dancing, and a variety of motions and postures of their bodies, which to me were in no wise attracting. The males danced by themselves, and the females also by themselves, as with us. The doctor showed his people the example, by immediately joining the women's party, though not by their choice. On perceiving the women disgusted, he joined the males. At night there were great illuminations, by setting fire to many pine trees, while the drake bot went round merrily by clubbishes or gourds, but the liquor might more justly be called eating than drinking. One Odin, the oldest father in the vicinity, was dressed in a strange and terrifying form. Around his body were skins adorned with different kinds of feathers, and he had on his head a very large and high head piece, in the form of a grenadier's cap, with prickles like a porcupine, and he made a certain noise which resembled the cry of an alligator. Our people skipped amongst them out of complaisance, though some could not drink of their fury, but our um met with customers enough, and was soon gone. The alligators were killed and some of them roasted. Their manner of roasting is by digging a hole in the earth, and filling it with wood, which they burn to coal, and then they lay sticks across, on which they set the meat. I had a raw piece of the alligator in my hand, it was very rich, I thought it looked like fresh salmon, and it had a most fragrant smell, but I could not eat any of it. This merry making at last ended without the least discord in any person in the company, although it was made up of different nations and complexions. The rainy season came on here about the latter end of May, 
which continued till August very heavily, so that the rivers were overflowed, and our provisions then in the ground were washed away. I thought this was in some measure a judgment upon us for working on Sundays, and it hurt my mind very much. I often wished to leave this place and sail for Europe, for our mode of procedure and living in this heathenish form was very irksome to me. The word of God saith, What does it avail a man if he gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? This was much and heavily impressed on my mind, and, though I did not know how to speak to the doctor for my discharge, it was disagreeable for me to stay any longer. But about the middle of June I took courage enough to ask him for it. He was very unwilling at first to grant my request, but I gave him so many reasons for it, that at last he consented to my going, and gave me the following certificate of my behavior. The bearer, Gustavus Vassar, has served me several years with strict honesty, sobriety, and fidelity. I can, therefore, with justice recommend him for these qualifications, and indeed in every respect I consider him as an excellent servant. I do hereby certify that he always behaved well, and that he is perfectly trustworthy. Charles Irving. Mosquito Shore, June 15, 1776. Though I was much attached to the doctor, I was happy when he consented. I got everything ready for my departure, and hired some Indians, with a large canoe, to carry me off. All my poor countrymen, the slaves, when they heard of my leaving them, were very sorry, as I had always treated them with care and affection, and did everything I could to comfort the poor creatures, and render their condition easy. Having taken leave of my old friends and companions, on the 18th of June, accompanied by the doctor, I left that spot of the world, and went southward above twenty miles along the river. There I found a sloop, the captain of which told me he was going to Jamaica. Having agreed for my passage with him and one of the owners, who was also on board, named Hughes, the doctor and I parted, not without shedding tears on both sides. The vessel then sailed along the river till night, when she stopped in a lagoon within the same river. During the night a schooner belonging to the same owners came in, and, as she was in want of hands, Hughes, the owner of the sloop, asked me to go in the schooner as a sailor, and said he would give me wages. I thanked him, but I said I wanted to go to Jamaica. He then immediately changed his tone, and swore, and abused me very much and asked how I came to be freed. I told him, and said that I came into that vicinity with Dr. Irving, whom he had seen that day. This account was of no use, he still swore exceedingly at me, and cursed the master for a fool that sold me my freedom, and the doctor for another in letting me go from him. Then he desired me to go in the schooner, or else I should not go out of the sloop as a freeman. I said this was very hard and begged to be put on shore again, but he swore that I should not. I said I had been twice amongst the Turks, yet had never seen any such usage with them, and much less could I have expected anything of this kind amongst Christians. This incensed him exceedingly, and, with a volley of oaths and imprecations, he replied, Christians! Damn you! You are one of St. Paul's men, but by God! except you have St. Paul's or St. Peter's faith, and walk upon the water to the shore, you shall not go out of the vessel, which I now found was going amongst the Spaniards towards Carthagena, where he swore he would sell me. I simply asked him what right he had to sell me. But, without another word, he made some of his people tie ropes round each of my ankles, and also to each wrist, and another rope round my body and hoisted me up without letting my feet touch or rest upon anything, thus I hung, without any crime committed, and without judge or jury, merely because I was a free man, and could not by the law get any redress from a white person in those parts of the world. I was in great pain from my situation, and cried and begged very hard for some mercy, but all in vain. My tyrant, in a great rage, brought a musk out of the cabin, and loaded it before me and the crew, and swore that he would shoot me if I cried any more. I had now no alternative, I therefore remained silent, seeing not one white man on board who said a word on my behalf. 
I hung in that manner from between 10 and 11 o'clock at night till about 1 in the morning, when, finding my cruel abuser fast asleep, I begged some of his slaves to slack the rope that was round my body, that my feet might rest on something. This they did at the risk of being cruelly used by their master, who beat some of them severely at first for not tying me when he commanded them. Whilst I remained in this condition, till between five and six o'clock next morning, I trust I prayed to God to forgive this blasphemer, who cared not what he did, but when he got up out of his sleep in the morning was of the very same temper and disposition as when he left me at night. When they got up the anchor, and the vessel was getting under way, I once more cried and begged to be released, and now, being fortunately in the way of their hoisting the sails, they released me. When I was let down, I spoke to one Mr. Cox, a carpenter, whom I knew on board, on the impropriety of this conduct. He also knew the doctor, and the good opinion he ever had of me. This man then went to the captain, and told him not to carry me away in that manner, that I was the doctor's steward, who regarded me very highly, and would resent this usage when he should come to know it on which he desired a young man to put me ashore in a small canoe I brought with me. This sound gladdened my heart, and I got hastily into the canoe and set off, whilst my tyrant was down in the cabin, but he soon spied me out, when I was not above thirty or forty yards from the vessel, and, running upon the deck with a loaded musket in his hand, he presented it at me, and swore heavily and dreadfully, that he would shoot me that instant, if I did not come back on board as I knew the wretch would have done as he said, without hesitation, I put back to the vessel again, but, as the good Lord would have it, just as I was alongside he was abusing the captain for letting me go from the vessel, which the captain returned, and both of them soon got into a very great heat. The young man that was with me now got out of the canoe, the vessel was sailing on fast with a smooth sea, and I then thought it was neck or nothing, so at that instant I set off again, for my life, in the canoe, towards the shore, and fortunately the confusion was so great amongst them on board, that I got out of the reach of the musky shot unnoticed, while the vessel sailed on with a fair wind a different way, so that they could not overtake me without tacking, but even before that could be done I should have been on shore, which I soon reached, with many thanks to God for this unexpected deliverance. I then went and told the other owner, who lived near that shore, with whom I had agreed for my passage, of the usage I had met with. He was very much astonished, and appeared very sorry for it. After treating me with kindness, he gave me some refreshment, and three heads of roasted Indian corn, for a voyage of about eighteen miles south, to look for another vessel. He then directed me to an Indian chief of a district, who was also the Mosquito Admiral, and had once been at our dwelling, after which I set off with the canoe across a large lagoon alone, for I could not get anyone to assist me, though I was much jaded, and had pains in my bowels, by means of the rope I had hung by the night before. I was therefore at different times unable to manage the canoe, for the paddling was very laborious. However, a little before dark I got to my destined place, where some of the Indians knew me, and received me kindly. I asked for the admiral, and they conducted me to his dwelling. He was glad to see me, and refreshed me with such things as the place afforded, and I had a hammock to sleep in. They acted towards me more like Christians than those whites I was amongst the last night, though they had been baptized. I told the admiral I wanted to go to the next port to get a vessel to carry me to Jamaica, and requested him to send the canoe back which I then had, for which I was to pay him. He agreed with me, and sent five able Indians with a large canoe to carry my things to my intended place, about fifty miles, and we set off the next morning. When we got out of the lagoon and went along shore, the sea was so high that the canoe was oftentimes very near being filled with water. We were obliged to go ashore and drag across different necks of land, we were also two nights in the swamps, which swarmed with mosquito flies, and they proved troublesome to us. This tiresome journey of land and water ended, however, on the third day, to my great joy, and I got on board of a sloop commanded by one Captain Jenning.
she was then partly loaded, and he told me he was expecting daily to sail for Jamaica, and having agreed with me to work my passage, I went to work accordingly. I was not many days on board before we sailed, but to my sorrow and disappointment, though used to such tricks, we went to the southward along the Mosquito shore, instead of steering for Jamaica. I was compelled to assist in cutting a great deal of mahogany wood on the shore as we coasted along it, and load the vessel with it, before she sailed. This fretted me much. But, as I did not know how to help myself among these deceivers, I thought patience was the only remedy I had left, and even that was forced. There was much hard work and little victuals on board, except by good luck we happened to catch turtles. On this coast there was also a particular kind of fish called manatee, which is most excellent eating, and the flesh is more like beef than fish. The scales are as large as a shilling, and the skin thicker than I ever saw that of any other fish. Within the brackish waters along shore there were likewise vast numbers of alligators, which made the fish scarce. I was on board this sloop sixteen days, during which, in our coasting, we came to another place, where there was a smaller sloop called the Indian Queen, commanded by one John Baker. He also was an Englishman, and had been a long time along the shore trading for turtle shells and silver, and he had got a good quantity of each on board. He wanted some hands very much, and, understanding I was a free man, and wanted to go to Jamaica, he told me if he could get one or two, that he would sail immediately for that island. He also pretended to me some marks of attention and respect, and promised to give me forty-five shillings sterling a month if I would go with him. I thought this much better than cutting wood for nothing. I therefore told the other captain that I wanted to go to Jamaica in the other vessel, but he would not listen to me, and, seeing me resolved to go in a day or two, he got the vessel to sail, intending to carry me away against my will. This treatment mortified me extremely. I immediately, according to an agreement I had made with the captain of the Indian Queen, called for her boat, which was lying near us, and it came alongside, and, by the means of a North Pole shipmate which I met within the sloop I was in, I got my things into the boat, and went on board of the Indian Queen, July the 10th. A few days after I was there, we got all things ready and sailed, but again, to my great mortification, this vessel still went to the south, nearly as far as Carthagena, trading along the coast, instead of going to Jamaica, as the captain had promised me, and, what was worst of all, he was a very cruel and bloody minded man, and was a horrid blasphemer. Among others, he had a white pilot, one stoker, whom he beat often as severely as he did some negroes he had on board. One night in particular, after he had beaten this man most cruelly, he put him into the boat, and made two negroes row him to a desolate quay, or small island, and he loaded two pistols, and swore bitterly that he would shoot the negroes if they brought Stoker on board again. There was not the least doubt but that he would do as he said, and the two poor fellows were obliged to obey the cruel mandate. But, when the captain was asleep, the two negroes took a blanket and carried it to the unfortunate stoker, which I believe was the means of saving his life from the annoyance of insects. A great deal of entreaty was used with the captain the next day, before he would consent to let Stoker come on board, and when the poor man was brought on board he was very ill, from his situation during the night, and he remained so till he was drowned a little time after. As we sailed southward we came to many uninhabited islands, which were overgrown with fine large cocoa nuts. As I was very much in want of provisions, I brought a boat load of them on board, which lasted me and others for several weeks, and afforded us many a delicious repast in our scarcity. One day, before this, I could not help observing the providential hand of God, that ever supplies all our wants, though in the ways and manner we know not. I had been a whole day without food, and made signals for boats to come off, but in vain. I therefore earnestly prayed to God for relief in my need, and at the close of the evening I went off the deck. Just as I laid down I heard a noise on the deck, and, not knowing what it meant, I went directly on the deck again, 
when what should I see but a fine large fish about seven or eight pounds, which had jumped aboard. I took it, and admired, with thanks, the good hand of God, and, what I considered as not less extraordinary, the captain, who was very avaricious, did not attempt to take it from me, there being only him and I on board, for the rest were all gone ashore trading. Sometimes the people did not come off for some days, this used to fret the captain, and then he would vent his fury on me by beating me, or making me feel in other cruel ways. One day especially, in his wild, wicked, and mad career, after striking me several times with different things, and once across my mouth, even with a red burning stick out of the fire, he got a barrel of gunpowder on the deck, and swore that he would blow up the vessel. I was then at my wit's end, and earnestly prayed to God to direct me. The head was out of the barrel, and the captain took a lighted stick out of the fire to blow himself and me up, because there was a vessel then in sight coming in, which he supposed was a Spaniard, and he was afraid of falling into their hands. Seeing this I got an axe, unnoticed by him, and placed myself between him and the powder, having resolved in myself as soon as he attempted to put the fire in the barrel to chop him down that instant. I was more than an hour in this situation, during which he struck me often, still keeping the fire in his hand for this wicked purpose. I really should have thought myself justifiable in any other part of the world if I had killed him, and prayed to God, who gave me a mind which rested solely on himself. I prayed for resignation, that his will might be done and the following two portions of his holy word, which occurred to my mind, buoyed up my hope, and kept me from taking the life of this wicked man. He hath determined the times before appointed, and set bounds to our habitations, Acts 17. 26. And, who is there amongst you that feareth the Lord, that abeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord, and stay upon his God, Isaiah 1. 10. And thus by the grace of God I was enabled to do. I found him a present help in the time of need, and the captain's fury began to subside as the night approached, but I found that he who cannot stem his anger's tide doth a wild horse without a bridle ride. The next morning we discovered that the vessel which had caused such a fury in the captain was an English sloop. They soon came to an anchor where we were, and, to my no small surprise, I learned that Dr. Irving was on board of her on his way from the Mosquito shore to Jamaica. I was for going immediately to see this old master and friend, but the captain would not suffer me to leave the vessel. I then informed the doctor, by letter, how I was treated, and begged that he would take me out of the sloop, but he informed me that it was not in his power, as he was a passenger himself, but he sent me some rum and sugar for my own use. I now learned that after I had left the estate which I managed for this gentleman on the Mosquito shore, during which the slaves were well fed and comfortable, a white overseer had supplied my place. This man, through inhumanity and ill-judged avarice, beat and cut the poor slaves most unmercifully, and the consequence was, that every one got into a large Puriogwa canoe, and endeavoured to escape, but not knowing where to go, or how to manage the canoe, they were all drowned, in consequence of which the doctor's plantation was left uncultivated, and he was now returning to Jamaica to purchase more slaves and stock it again. On the 14th of October the Indian Queen arrived at Kingston in Jamaica. When we were unloaded I demanded my wages, which amounted to eight pounds and five shillings sterling, but Captain Baker refused to give me one farthing, although it was the hardest earned money I ever worked for in my life. I found out Dr. Irving upon this, and acquainted him of the captain's knavery. He did all he could to help me to get my money and we went to every magistrate in Kingston, and there were nine, but they all refused to do anything for me, and said my oath could not be admitted against a white man. Nor was this all, for Baker threatened that he would beat me severely if he could catch me for attempting to demand my money, and this he would have done, but that I got, by means of Dr. Irving, under the protection of Captain Douglas of the Squirrel Man of War.
I thought this exceedingly hard usage, though indeed I found it to be too much the practice that to pay free men for their labor in this manner. One day I went with a free Negro tailor, named Joe Diamond, to one Mr. Cochran, who was indebted to him some trifling sum, and the man, not being able to get his money, began to murmur. The other immediately took a horsewhip to pay him with it, but, by the help of a good pair of heels, the tailor got off. Such oppressions as these made me seek for a vessel to get off the island as fast as I could, and by the mercy of God I found a ship in November bound for England, when I embarked with a convoy, after having taken a last farewell of Dr. Irving. When I left Jamaica he was employed in refining sugars, and some months after my arrival in England I learned, with much sorrow, that this my amiable friend was dead, owing to his having eaten some poisoned fish. We had many very heavy gales of wind in our passage, in the course of which no material incident occurred, except that an American privateer, falling in with the fleet, was captured and set fire to by His Majesty's ship the Squirrel. On January 7, 1777, we arrived at Plymouth. I was happy once more to tread upon English ground, and, after passing some little time at Plymouth and Exeter among some pious friends, whom I was happy to see, I went to London with a heart replete with thanks to God for all past mercies, 